This is Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. We just heard from Republican Senator Katie Britt and before that, President Joe Biden. He used his State of the Union address to warn that democracy is endangered at home and abroad. Walks away. Walks away. It will put, it will put Ukraine, Ukraine at risk. At risk. Europe, Europe is at risk. Is at risk. The free, the free world, world will be at risk, risk. emboldening others, others to do what, to do they, what they wish to do us, to do us harm. harm. My, My message, message to President, President Putin, Putin, Putin I've known for a long time, time is simple. simple. We, we will, will not, not walk, walk away. away. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Bill Farris now for some context. So, Bill, what was President Biden's key message on global issues such as the war in Ukraine, for example? Well, as you saw there, he kicked off his speech, a 66-minute speech, by talking immediately about what he said was a threat to democracy at home and abroad. Abroad, specifically, he was talking about Ukraine. He said the U.S. needed, the U.S. Congress needed to approve that $60 billion aid package that's been languishing since really late last year. And he said, uh, he said to the opponents of that legislation in the Congress that Vladimir Putin would not stop uh, if he succeeds in Ukraine, that he would go on to other countries. Uh, that bill, as you know, has passed the Senate. It's been held up in the House. Uh, it's a smaller group of Republicans, a smaller but growing group of Republicans who have opposed that. It's still not clear if or when that legislation will pass. Uh, he also went on and, and later on in the speech just made small mention of China, actually. He said he wants to focus on competition, not conflict with China. He criticized his predecessor, Donald Trump, for not enacting tougher legislation to block high technology uh, exports to China. He said uh, that's something that his administration has done to make sure the U.S. maintains a technological edge. And Bill, how much of this 66-minute speech was a political pitch to voters ahead of the November election? Uh, probably all 66 minutes, really. It was a unique opportunity for uh, President Biden to have a microphone to himself, not have to take questions, and to address the American people, really to kind of reframe uh, or set the debate for the political campaign ahead. He hit a lot of the key domestic issues that voters uh, are likely to focus on, uh, issues including immigration, uh, abortion rights, the economy, inflation, uh, a whole range of things that are expected to be hot button topics going forward. And uh, to try to contest that, you had uh, Donald Trump posting on his social media site, Truth Social, kind of throughout the speech. So this was very much a political speech aimed at uh, trying to win over voters who may, frankly, not be paying that much attention to the election now, uh, but will be hearing a lot about it in the coming uh, seven and a half, eight months. Yeah, for sure. Bill, thank you so much for all that context. Much appreciated. That's Bloomberg's Bill Farries there. And another issue that the president spoke about, spoke about directing the U.S. military to establish a temporary port on the Gaza coast to ramp up the delivery of aid and ease the humanitarian crisis in the territory, sparked, of course, by the Israel-Hamas war. That will have resonated with Michigan voters in particular. Let's get more now, though, on these steps from Bloomberg's Dana Kreish. So what exactly has Biden announced, Dana? Good morning um, from Dubai. Um... President Biden uh, dedicated a good chunk of that address to what's happening in the region, particularly the Israeli-Hamas war. Um, he said Israel has a fundamental responsibility to protect civilians. Um, he was saying that more than 30 Palestinians have been killed. He talked a lot about the dire humanitarian situation there, uh, saying it was heartbreaking. Um, he also said he was working on an, a ceasefire, a six-week ceasefire um, to end the war in Gaza. He also spoke about an during peace in the region, and he mentioned that he is in talks with Saudi Arabia, of course, about potentially normalizing ties with Israel. Now, the most important thing was that he was saying that he will direct the U.S. military to uh, lead a mission to establish a peer, a port uh, on the Mediterranean coast to increase uh, assistance to uh, Gaza, humanitarian assistance, and um, saying that Israel also must do its part to allow more aid into Gaza. But the important bit was that they yes. want to establish some some sort of a port um, to increase aid assistance and uh, into Gaza. Yeah, a phenomenal increase in aid, as you say. Dana, thank you so much for joining us. That's Bloomberg's Dana Kreish there. 
Well, in markets news, two major central banks have delivered fresh signals that interest rate cuts are on the way. Fed Chair Jerome Powell telling a Senate panel that policymakers are getting closer to the confidence they need to start easing. Let's bring in Jean Chia, CIO at the Bank of Singapore. So, Jean, did you hear anything from Powell that might suggest that we will be cutting come June? Hi, Dan. Hi, Bonnie. Thanks very much for having me today as well. Yes, indeed, you know, the comments by Powell does point towards uh, the fact that the Fed is uh, now ready to act in terms of uh, rate cuts. Uh, we have some sympathy for monetary policy taking uh, longer than one expects. Uh, Milton Friedman, economist, famously said that monetary policy does take long and variable lags. And the question now is whether those lags last six months or, or more than that. So certainly uh, we are awaiting of course, uh, more data in terms of CPI numbers next week as well on whether that this inflation trend uh, that we've been expecting uh, globally, whether that will actually start to pan out and giving the Fed a window to start to cut rates uh, potentially towards June of this year. Well, and of course, we get jobs data in a few hours out of the United States for February. Economists looking for about 200,000 jobs created. W would that allow the Fed to continue on this path and to consider cutting mid-year? Yeah, I think that would be a corroborative evidence, so to speak, right, to, to also the fact that um, the Fed does have a dual mandate in terms of jobs, uh, health of the jobs market, as well as, uh, of course, on the inflation front. So I, as, as the two factors start to align, I think that will give uh, Fed confidence that we will see uh, inflation head towards the 2% target. And that is indeed, you know, a very constructive uh, backdrop for the Fed to start to cut rates as well. Jean, I need to ask you about the yen because we were at 147 and change earlier. We're finally seeing some strengthening. You know, as an organization, we're wondering when the yen goes through 140. What are you anticipating and when? Right. So the yen is a, a function of two variables. I mean, clearly also in terms of Fed policy, uh, as expectations of Fed rate cut uh, point towards the weakening of the dollar, that's of course also very uh, constructive for the yen. Our yen out outlook from a 12-month uh, horizon is uh, towards 130, in fact. So we're actually constructive in terms of yen strength uh, on a 12-month basis. But certainly we do think that the Bank of Japan's monetary policy will be a critical point uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, weeks and towards April, uh, where we do expect uh, the Bank of Japan to potentially end its negative interest rate policy uh, from the negative 0.1% to zero. Jean, that's some serious appreciation you're anticipating. Would it all be because of the interest rate moves and the dollar moves? That seems like a lot. 20 big figures? No, absolutely not as well. So on, in terms of the domestic factor, we are seeing the return of uh, inflation in Japan after you know th over three decades of a deflationary cycle. Uh, we think that that's uh, quite a structural shift in terms of uh, inflation in Japan. And that also will propel um, the uh, economy in that sense. So as uh, wage inflation starts to increase, I think we'll see a positive spiral in terms of the end of deflation. And that will also be constructive on the yen. Now, as we speak, uh, uh, Japanese uh, trade unions are also working with it, with corporates in terms of potential wage rises in Japan. Uh, so the number that has been bandied around is uh, over 5% in terms of wage increases that the trade unions are lobbying for. Now, whether that is uh, materializes or not, I think we do see uh, wage inflation starting to kick in uh, for the second time since uh, last year in uh, March of the last year. In April of last year, the spring negotiation, mm. Shunto, in short, uh, has also panned out. So this will be the second year running. Uh, that is really yes. a more structural shift uh, constructed for the yen. Jean, thank you so much. Right now, the yen at 147.86. Much appreciate your time today. That is Jean Chia, Global CIO at the Bank of Singapore. Plenty more is still ahead. Do stay with us. This is Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa.
Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. The U.S. will establish a temporary port on the Gaza coast to ramp up the delivery of aid and ease the humanitarian crisis. President Joe Biden just delivered his State of the Union address. We discussed that and the Republican response throughout the show. Plus, global stocks rise on dovish signs from central banks. Jerome Powell says the Fed is not far from the confidence level needed to ease policy. Focus now shifts to U.S. jobs data out later. Just gone 8.30 across the Emirates. I'm in Dubai. Let's have a look at how markets are shaping up as we enter the Friday trading session and await that crucial jobs report. So yesterday, markets seem to have taken Jerome Powell's comments as really the all-go signal. Today we're looking at a mixed picture for futures, but we are several hours away. And don't forget, the S&P was up 1% yesterday, the Nasdaq 1.6%. On the 10-year yield, we're back to where we were about a month ago, 408.27. We were at around 411 a month ago. And Brent crude is seeing a little bit of strength. But I want to point you to this chart because it does show, according to Bloomberg Economics Models, that the Fed is actually getting less hawkish. It might be something that we felt in our bones, but we definitely got some corroboration of that yesterday from Fed Chair Jerome Powell's comments. A lot less hawkish in terms of commentary from the Fed. The market now pricing in about 90 basis points of cuts this year, which is just a little more than the 75 basis points that the Fed has signaled. Well, a lot going on, of course, across Asia as well. Let's check in on how markets there are doing. Avril Hong is in our Singapore studio. Avril. Yeah, Bonnie, those Powell and ECB signals, dovish and helping to provide support for Asian equities. Even the Nikkei is rebounding, recouping some of the declines from yesterday where it fell by the most since late January as the yen rallied. And this is on the back of traders speculating that the Bank of Japan will lift off with rates in two weeks' time. Indeed, we're seeing the Japanese benchmark's performance this year very closely correlated to the weak yen. So we're going to see potentially some risk for the Japanese benchmark given how the Japanese currency is faring. Let's flip the board because that also seems to be what traders are pricing in. We're seeing on the one-month risk reversal rate they are favouring a stronger yen, downward trajectory for dollar yen. And this is, of course, against the backdrop of data that we got today, showing Japan household spending dropped. Investors seem to be shrugging that off because financial markets barely moved on the data. They are focusing very much on what we got this week from BOJ policymakers' comments, uh, wage data, as well as labour unions demanding higher pay. Funny? That's for sure. Avril, thank you so, so much for that. We'll be back with you a little later on. This is Avril Hong in Singapore. Well, in his State of the Union address, President Joe Biden said that he is directing the U.S. military to establish a temporary port on the Gaza coast to ramp up the delivery of aid and ease the humanitarian crisis in the territory, sparked, of course, by the Israel-Hamas war. We know that this is something that will then be attached to the private sector at some point, but for the moment at least, it's a unilateral U.S. move on the part of the U.S. military. Let's get more details from Bloomberg's Dana Kreish. So, Dana, Biden has announced this massive increase in aid. How quickly can get this get done, given that, you know, a port needs to presumably get built? Yes, good morning. Um... Well, President Biden said that he uh, he wants to direct U.S. military to lead a mission to establish a pier, a port on the Mediterranean coast um, near Gaza to increase aid and humanitarian aid in, in, into the enclave. And the, the main challenge that we're thinking about is this is going to take a few weeks, maybe a lot of weeks to be built. Um, and the logistics of that could be hard, whether you're sending U.S. military or you're sending just mil uh, personnel. Um, another challenge that I could see with this is how Iran will view this, probably as more of a challenge to its presence in the region as well. I mean, we have to remember that Iran wants to squeeze U.S. presence out of the region entirely and has seized this crisis to do so, um, you know, given all the attacks on U.S. assets, whether in Syria, Iraq, um, the Houthis and, and Hezbollah as well. Well, these two haven't, um, well, Houthis have attacked U.S. assets and uh, particularly U.S. warships. So how this will pan out and how Iran will seize this um, is going to be also critical to that mission survival. But the optics wouldn't be good, right, Dana, if there was any kind of response from another regime, for example, 
against what is essentially a humanitarian mission from the United States to Gaza. Exactly so. So it, the optics are, are not going to be well received and in places like Iran and its proxies around the region. And we've seen this asymmetrical warfare playing out and how Iran has used these proxies to attack Israel and also to attack U.S. presence in the region. Um, and, you know, maybe if it was more of an Arab-led um, aid assistance, it would have been a different story for Iran and the others. But this is definitely going to be a tough challenge for the U.S. First, in building uh, such a port, it probably would need assistance as well, and um, how long that would take to bring in this most needed aid into Gaza. Um, and of course, the third is how Iran would view it. Exactly. And it's going to be said, whether or not it's true, that this is a little bit of an election move on the part of President Biden as well. I mean, it was the State of the Union address, after all. It couldn't have been timed better, this announcement. Is that too cynical of you? Um, no, I think he's definitely using that. And, and, and as you can see, he dedicated kind of a, a good chunk to the crisis in the region um, in his State of the Union address. And there has been some backlash to him not doing enough to convince Israel to either agree on a ceasefire or end the, end the war on Gaza or even allow for more humanitarian aid. And we saw him being a little bit critical um, uh, against Israel in this address. He was saying Israel has a fundamental responsibility to protect civilians. He was talking about the 30,000 Palestinians that have been killed so far in the war on Gaza, saying two millions have been displaced, cities in ruins, and he was saying it's heartbreaking. Um, he also said that he was working to get a six-week ceasefire in place and that um, he also spoke about an enduring peace in the region and how he is also speaking with the mm. Saudis to get them on board for a potential normalization uh, with Israel. So he is saying that, look, we are critical of Israel, but we will be taking things into our yes. own hands, um, either with the aid drops, uh, you know, from the airdrops of uh, aid into Gaza, mm -hmm. or now with the proposal of building a port. Dana, where are we on the ceasefire? Is there any hope that Dan there might be something now before Ramadan, or is it just out of the question at this point? It's now unlikely from our reporting, it seems that hopes are fading to reach a ceasefire agreement before Ramadan, and that's kind of the deadline. Ramadan is expected to start between March 11 or March 10. And so with nothing so far tangible on the table, either from Hamas or Israel, it is hard to see a ceasefire agreement materializing before that deadline. Dana, thank you so much. That is Bloomberg's Dana Kresh there in Dubai. Sub-Saharan Africa is returning to the global bond market. Ivory Coast, Benin and Kenya broke the region's two-year euro bond issuance hiatus this year. And Bloomberg Economics expects Nigeria, Angola, South Africa and Gabon to follow. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga in Kigali for more on this. So a big return to the euro bond market, it seems, this year, Ondiro. Tell us what we're anticipating. We're anticipating to see many more African countries go back to the Eurobond market to try and secure facilities. And this is because of a couple of reasons. One, um, many of them had been locked out of the borrowing market because of rising interest rate. But now, because of the prospects of borrowing costs becoming lower and lower, we are likely to see many more countries go back to the market. Um, we are also seeing others um, having a need to raise revenue to pay back their bonds. Take Kenya, for example. They had a $2 billion Eurobond due this year, June, that left investors a little bit jittery on their ability to pay back the loan. They went back to the market, secured a $1.5 billion facility, but they paid through their teeth interest rate of 10.375, which is way higher than what Ivory Coast and Benin secured at below 10%. And maybe finally, there are other countries that are not as struggling as Kenya. They have good fundamentals, which will ease their access to the market to get money to show up their FX liquidity and also seek alternative financing for their budget deficits. For sure. Andira, do we know what kind of appetite there is out there and if these will be successful sales? 
Well, there's quite an appetite there. Take Nigeria, for example. They have a euro bond um, of $1.2 billion coming in 2025. And so we're expecting that they'll be in the market in the last quarter of this year. And they literally have little to no wiggle room because currently they're grappling with FX liquidity. Um, their reserves have fallen from $42 billion before the pandemic to now $33 billion. However, the cost of this issuance will not be as expensive as Kenya's because we're expecting that by the time they go to the market, the rates would have gone down. Another country that we are likely to see go to the market is Angola. They also have a facility of $864 million due in 2025. And they're grappling with a weak external position. Their oil revenues have been declining, which has shrunk their current account by a third. And also their currency has taken a beating to the dollar, 40% to be precise. Oof, yeah, Andero, difficult times. Andero, thank you so much. That's Andero Oganga there in Kigali, Rwanda. South African financial services company Sanlam is supporting a controversial government plan to overhaul the country's healthcare system. CEO Paul Hanratty told us how the private sector could benefit from the National Health Insurance Bill. Our constitution requires us to, um, to provide universal health care. Certainly, we think that that is uh, something that can be done in this country. Uh, I, I do believe that one of the key issues is what exactly the minimum benefits are. These have not been uh, laid out. So when people say that it's unaffordable, that is based on an assumption, and I would go as so far as to say speculation, as to exactly what those minimum benefits are. If they cost at the right level and build up over time, um, it may well be affordable. The other thing is that the private sector, the private health sector in South Africa is unbelievably good and is able to deliver, I believe, a lot of what the country needs. In fact, I'm told that the private sector can, um, you know, can offer a hospital bed for less than the public sector. So one of the big issues is efficiency. And actually, if we could have the right public-private uh, partnership in this space, it actually could be, you know, very good for the country. So. I don't start out as, as negative about the bill. I think there are a lot of undefined pieces about it that will need to be dealt with. I think one of the big dangers is that the determination of the, what the, those benefits are that will be provided in terms of the uh, national health insurance are left in the hands of a single person, uh, as I understand it. And that clearly can be pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the area that needs to be addressed. And the other side of it would be the financing. You know, how, how should it be financed? And, you know, how much need is needed depends on the level of benefits. You can go back in the circle. So um, I think there's lots of work for everybody to do, you know, in this, in this area. And that was the Sanlam CEO, Paul Hanratty, speaking to my colleague, Jennifer Zapasacha. And she's coming up at the top of the hour, so do stay tuned for that. Plenty more is still ahead on Daybreak Middle East and Africa. This is Bloomberg. The CEO of McLaren Racing has denied that Formula One has a culture problem following allegations of misconduct by Red Bull team principal Christian Horner. Zach Brown spoke to my colleague Guy Johnson from the Bloomberg Power Players event in Jeddah. I don't think Formula One has a, a culture problem. I think if you look at uh, the way the sport has become very uh, inclusive, the, you know, we have our, our female racing series, the F1 Academy, uh, debuting this weekend uh, at, at McLaren. We've got uh, lots of uh, awesome activities to embrace uh, you know, underrepresented individuals in, in the sport, in, including uh, women around the STEM. So I think what we're uh, unfortunately uh, the, the topic here, I believe, is uh, an isolated uh, incident that uh, rests with uh, a team that, you know, is, is working through this issue. The sport's working through the issue. I think it needs to be handled in a very uh, transparent manner. There's lots of rumors and speculation until things, I think, be, uh, become clear to everyone. Those rumors and speculations will continue. But uh, yep. I do not believe it represents the, uh, the wider form of the one. Okay, you mentioned F1 Academy. It kicks off this weekend. Uh, we're all delighted to see that happening. This is designed, as you say, to promote women 
in the sport, and, and that's fantastic. But, but do you not think that, unfortunately, the timing is bad here? That ultimately that launch, that, that effort to really push that side of the sport is going to be undermined by what is happening here? I think reality is timing's never good for a, a situation like this. I think it's uh, it's very unfortunate. It's the start of the Formula One season, as you as you mentioned. We've got the, the great you know F1 Academy that you know all the teams are participating in. It's something we've put a lot of time and effort into and are very excited about. So yeah, it's it's not good timing, but I don't think there would have been good timing yep. uh, for for this particular story. So I I just hope that the uh, the governing body. Uh, deals with it uh, in, in a swift manner because it is going on and has gone on uh, too long to have a conclusion that uh, everyone feels satisfied is is the right conclusion. So hopefully uh, that will happen here in, in short order so we can uh, focus on our racing. And that was McLaren Racing CEO Zach Brown speaking there to Bloomberg's Guy Johnson. Plenty more still ahead. This is Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. It's the world's second largest economy with a growing influence in global affairs. But geopolitical uncertainties, deflationary pressures, and questions about foreign investment linger. Bloomberg, The China Show brings you the unmatched expertise you need to keep track of breaking news, in-depth market analysis, and the most influential newsmakers in and around China. Bloomberg, The China Show, now weekdays at 9 a.m. Hong Kong time, right here on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. It's Jobs Day, and Bloomberg has the report under surveillance. We've had unemployment sat the 4% for two consecutive years. This is a two-sided sword. There is a softening in labor demand. Today, Jonathan, Lisa, Anne Marie, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is a very strong labor market. The White House has got to love this. This is something huge they want to run on. Where is the slowdown? If you look at the reality, it ain't showing that. The February Jobs Report, today on Bloomberg. Capital Group President, CEO and founder James Denny Jr. says that providing growth equity is key, adding that his firm uh, is soon opening an office in Riyadh with a focus on expansion. He also said Formula One was growing in the region. He spoke exclusively with Francine Lacroix on the sidelines of the Bloomberg Power Players event in Jeddah. The initiatives that we have uh, have been discussing have been really an extension of our discussions with the Ministry of Investment here in Saudi. Um, and we've also established a joint venture with the Al Hukair Group, which is a pretty well-known family and family uh, company in Saudi. I think they're based in 1975. Uh, very well known in retail, real estate, uh, and they had JVs, to be honest, all over the world. Um, so as an extension of our discussions with, with the folks at, at uh, the Ministry of, of Investment, that that uh, JV uh, uh, came about. Yeah, I mean, there's so much opportunity in infrastructure. It feels like renewables in tourism. Where do you see the, the biggest value creation? You know, we've the JV that, that I just described is to establish uh, a direct lending fund in in uh, in the kingdom. Um, and we're also uh, planning on investing through our portfolio companies into the kingdom as well, because we, we own great companies uh, that would extend and transcend uh, their brands, their operations here in the kingdom as well. Um, but getting back to the, the direct lending fund, um, if, you, if you really look at uh, the, the, the need for uh, capital and solutions for small and medium-sized businesses in the kingdom, it just doesn't exist, primarily because the, the bankruptcy and the restructuring laws were really just codified last June. Uh, before that, it was not even a contemplation for third parties to come into the region. So, we, the, so joint venture between ourselves and the Ahu Care Group uh, is a great combination. Uh, you know, having them as a partner in the kingdom, having their network uh, as a backer is, is, is great for us. We are establishing a, an office in Riyadh. Um, we plan on uh, adding up to 20, 25 uh, employees uh, in the next uh, six months, six or nine months. 
And that was the Capital Group President, CEO and Founder James Zenny Jr. at the Bloomberg Power Players event in Jeddah. Now, Bloomberg has learned that Abu Dhabi Wealth Fund, ADQ, has picked advisors, including Citigroup, HSBC, and first Abu Dhabi Bank for a potential IPO of Etihad Airways. Let's get more with our equities reporter, Farah El Bahrawi. So, Farah, tell us more about this listing. These banks have been chosen, according to people familiar with the matter. How long will it be before we see more details? Good morning, Bonnie. Yes, for Etihad, they also uh, hired uh, Rothschild as an independent financial advisor. Uh, we don't know details about the timing and the size yet, but we uh, do know that this would be the first major uh, carrier uh, in the Gulf uh, from uh, uh, one of the, you know, big name airlines such as the Had Emirates and Qatar Airways. Um, the fund had previously been weighing a direct listing of this uh, company, but is now pivoting to towards a, a full scale IPO. Um, the airline has reported this week that its earnings grew five-fold, Bonnie, uh, in its uh, annual profit release. So this is a sector that's really growing, that's really booming. And at, this listing will come for Etihad after a few ye uh, tumultuous years um, of a cost growth plan. And again, would mark uh, a first for the sector in the region and comes amid a, really an IPO boom. Uh, where uh, listings are heavily oversubscribed, there is major demand, and foreigners and locals alike want uh, a piece of uh, uh, sale. Yeah, do we know where it might be listed, Farah? Yeah, so it, it, it had this owned by ADQ, so the listing would naturally take place in Abu Dhabi. So the Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, is essentially uh, the one that will have the final word, word on the listing. And... Uh, we will be watching, not necessarily sure yet about the timing, uh, but uh, at the head CEO told CNBC that in the end, ABC will be the one taking the final decision. And then, Farah, let's move to Egypt, because we are hearing more about potential investments in Egypt, even as, you know, great news for the country yesterday from the IMF and, and so on, and obviously lots of monetary policy changes. But the stock market is still extraordinarily volatile. Why? Absolutely. So for the EGX 30, the day the currency was devalued and the central bank hiked interest rates, Bonnie, the index went up as much as 5.1%, closed 3% lower. The next day rose another 5%. So clearly a lot of volatility in the Egyptian stock exchange yesterday was up 5% after Egypt uh, closed the deal with the IMF for $8 billion. And Again, analysts are expecting this volatility to continue. In terms of sectors, uh, mm. banks and real estates are the one in focus. And uh, yes, equities they'll be the primary field. beneficiaries, I imagine, Farah. Yeah. Absolutely. Farah, thank you so much. We'll continue to watch the story. And as you say, banks and real estate, uh, some of the primary beneficiaries of that Egypt news. That's Farah El Bahwari, our equities reporter. More coming up next with Jennifer Zapasaja joining me from Johannesburg. Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa are top stories this morning. The U.S. will establish a temporary port on the Gaza coast to ramp up the delivery of aid and ease the humanitarian crisis. President Biden just delivered his State of the Union address. We discuss that and the Republican response throughout the show. Plus, global stocks rise on dovish signs from central banks. Jerome Powell says the Fed is not far from the confidence needed to ease policy. Focus now shifts to U.S. jobs data out later today. It is just past 9 a.m. across the Emirates, 7 a.m. here in Johannesburg. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja. Happy Friday to you, Vani. 
Happy Friday and International Women's Day to you as well, Jennifer. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. Let's take a look at that momentum that Jen was just talking about because we did see yesterday the S&P 500 rise 1% and the Nasdaq 1.6% after Fed Chair Jerome Powell's comments sort of gave the go-ahead to stock markets to think about maybe June potentially as a first interest rate cut, but that at least cuts are coming. Markets are now pricing in around 90 basis points of cuts this year, and you can see that from the 10-year yield, which is actually below where it was about a month ago we're at 407.88 now declining all the while and then just a quick eye on crude because it does continue to strengthen i do want to point to this chart though bloomberg economics had a look at its modeling and realized and found that you know just as you might have anticipated fed speak has got less hawkish and particularly less so over the last few weeks jen yeah, a very interesting chart there, Bonnie. Look, I want to take a look at the Bloomberg Dollar Index because it is starting off weaker on Friday. And if we take a look at where the dollar has been over the past uh, few days, uh, it's not been the best of weeks. This is the sixth day of declines for the greenback. Not just that, it's also headed for its third weekly drop and the longest losing streak of the year. Uh, but that weakness, potentially good signs for other currencies with most major and emerging market currencies higher over the past five days. There you can see the MSCI uh, EM Currency Index. Uh, and leading the way this week is South Africa's RAND, uh, if you can see right there. But the question is, will today's U.S. jobs data impact the dollar's trajectory? Uh, and how exactly will that trickle uh, across the world? So we'll pay close attention to that. Meanwhile, let's check in on how markets in Asia are faring. Avril Hong is in our Singapore studio. Hey, Avril. Hey, Jen. Yeah, we'll be keeping a close watch on the U.S. jobs data as well, but we are already seeing markets running along with those dovish signals from Powell and the ECB. Stocks as well as currencies in the region supported TSMC surging to the highest on record ahead of its February sales data. The Nikkei recouping some of the losses from yesterday, which was its biggest decline since late January as the yen rallies with investors betting that we'll see a BOJ normalization of policy in two weeks weeks. And we're actually seeing on the Nikkei, based on one measure, uh, the so-called beta, the most sensitive to yen moves since 2022. Now let's flip the board and take a look at what investors, traders are pricing in on the yen's trajectory. Based on the one-month risk reversal rates, they are betting that we'll see further downside for dollar yen. Today also shrugging off some data that we got on household spending in Japan, that data dropping. Funny. April, thank you so much. April Hong there in Singapore. In his State of the Union address, President Joe Biden acknowledged the, quote, heartbreaking devastation in Gaza. And he announced U.S. military plans to establish a temporary port on the Gaza coast to ramp up the delivery of aid and ease the humanitarian crisis in the territory, which, of course, was sparked by the Israel-Hamas war. I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. Let's get more now from Bloomberg's Dana Kreish. Dana, pretty extraordinary move here, a unilateral move on the part of the United States to deliver purely humanitarian aid. How long will it take to get this pier built? Yes. So you, as president, um, directed the military to lead a mission to establish this pier or port on the Mediterranean coast uh, to increase aid into Gaza. Now, this can be challenging and may take long. From our reporting today, um, we are saying that this could take a few weeks and even longer to build um, to build that port. And although he said, you know, no boots on the ground, it probably will take some U.S. military personnel to, um, you know, for security security reasons or to help out in the building of this port. And as that port is being built, they will probably continue to airdrop aid into Gaza. Uh, and Donna, considering where we're at uh, in terms of this crisis, I mean, how how challenging is this going to be to actually pull off uh, and pull off successfully? It's going to be challenging, I think, in terms of how Iran will see this 
support and how it will view it. Um, Iran's main goal is to actually squeeze U.S. presence out of the region. And this port means more U.S. presence. And like I said, he did say no boots on the ground, and this is temporary. But it does remain to be seen how Iran will view, the, view it and how its proxies around the region will view it as well. Those proxies that have attacked U.S. presence in Iraq and Syria. And that also uh, prompted a response from the U.S. But still, they did attack it, um, especially the Houthis um, in the southern Red Sea. So it's going to be tough, and, and it will remain to be seen whether other countries will join this uh, in building it or in sending aid through the ports like the UAE or Saudi, who's also been uh, sending aid into Gaza. UAE and Jordan particularly have been also doing airdrops uh, of, of this dire humanitarian aid in, in Gaza. What about Israel's response, Dana? I mean, it hasn't been but a few hours. Has Israel had a chance to respond? From our reporting, it seems Israel is welcoming uh, this development. Um, and in the State of the Union address, we saw President Biden um, kind of uh, sending a critical message to Israel, saying you have a fundamental responsibility to protect civilians. He was talking about um, what he described as heartbreaking situation in Gaza, um, talking about cities in ruin, 2 million people uh, displaced, 30,000 Palestinian killed. Um, he was also trying, I think what the most important thing is, of course, the ceasefire talks. And he said, I have been working on a six-week ceasefire uh, to bring in peace into, into, into Gaza. He also spoke about an enduring peace in the region and mentioned that he is speaking with Saudi Arabia to potentially normalize ties. So the most uh, important thing is, of course, the ceasefire. And that is pretty much not going to materialize uh, before Ramadan, which is the deadline that all the parties have put. The really great reporting there. Bloomberg's Donna Koresh uh, joining us from Dubai. Uh, Donna, thank you so much for that. All right. Sticking with the State of the Union, President Joe Biden also warned that democracy is in danger at home and abroad, a threat, he says, made more immediate by the prospect of his predecessor, Donald Trump, returning to the White House. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Bill Ferries, who has been following uh, this story, of course, all throughout the night. Uh, so, Bill, as Donna was just saying there, definitely much more political speech uh, from the president, what were what would you say is the standout in terms of his key messages uh, in terms of issues that are going on on the global stage? Right. Well, he kicked off his speech, as you mentioned, talking about what he called the threat to democracy at home and abroad. And he began right with Ukraine, the war in uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. He said it was uh, urgent for the U.S. Congress to pass this $60 billion aid package that's been stalled uh, really on the House side since uh, since the end of last year. Uh, he's uh, basically said that he doesn't think Vladimir Putin will stop if he succeeds in Ukraine. And, uh, and he continued uh, his vow that no American troops will be sent into that conflict. But he said it's urgent to get that kind of aid passed. It remains to be seen whether that will happen. There's still negotiations going on about uh, the Pentagon and the defense, uh, the defense industry, the defense uh, department's budget. So that's something that we'll have to see uh, whether it emerges in the next two to three weeks. And Bill, how much of this was a political pitch to voters ahead of the November election? It was a 66-minute speech, and basically 100 percent of that was directed towards uh, voters uh, look, starting to pay attention to that November election. He hit on a lot of the big hot-button issues, including some that I think Democrats have been criticized for. He talked a lot about immigration policies, said he needed new legislation to take control of the situation at the border. He talked about uh, abortion rights and, uh, and some recent Supreme Court decisions in the state of Alabama that have affected uh, in vitro uh, in vitro fertilization policies. So this was very much a, a political speech. It gave him an opportunity to have the microphone without any rebuttals from Republicans. He actually had some back and forth with Republicans in the chamber. And uh, I think one of his top goals was to show that he was vigorous and engaged in the big issues that American voters are going to have the next seven to eight months to de debate in their, uh, at their kitchen table. Yeah, well, it's certainly kicked off now, Bill. That is Bloomberg's Bill Farries joining us there. Thank you so much for the context. Do stay with us. Plenty more still ahead right here on Daybreak Middle East and Africa. This is Bloomberg.
major central banks have delivered fresh signals that interest rate cuts are on the way. Fed Chair Jerome Powell telling a Senate panel that policymakers are getting close to the confidence level they need to start easing. Place, which is we're waiting to see, we're waiting to become more confident that inflation is moving sustainably at 2%. Mm -hmm. When we do get that confidence and we're not far from it, it'll be appropriate to begin to dial back the level of restriction so that we don't, you know, drive the economy into recession rather than normalizing policy as the economy gets back to normal. Bloomberg's M Live strategist Mary Nicola joins us now for more. So, Mary, how close is the Fed from their very first rate cut after all this time? Yeah, a lot of it will depend on what we get out of the inflation numbers. So, for example, today's average, average hourly earnings is going to be absolutely crucial. The CPI data, remember that last month we had an uptick in the month-on-month -month numbers. So uh, the Fed really wants to make sure that this wasn't a start of a, tr uh, of a new trend, that we're seeing a, a re-spike in inflation. They want to see that there's disinflationary pressures. So it really doesn't matter how strong the job report is. It will What will really matter is the average hourly earnings um, today and then of course next week what the CPI numbers come through and of course if we see those disinflationary pressures come through and of course we were already seeing um, PCE numbers fall below 2% you know in December so if that still comes through um, then the Fed will be a lot closer potentially even June will be on the table. And Mary, as you note uh, in your M Live uh, note, uh, a little bit different in terms of uh, across the bond, uh, or across the pond, excuse me, with the ECB and Christine Lagarde uh, being a bit more transparent about sort of the trajectory. I mean, can you just sort of counter what is happening with the Fed with now what's happening with the ECB? Absolutely. So there's a, there's a key divergence. And in markets, we love transparency. We love clarity. And of course, that's what the ECB has given the markets, is the saying that we're going to cut in June, as opposed to the Fed still remains a little bit data dependent. So of course, we're going to be looking at CPI data. And then after CPI data, it'll be PPI data. And then of course, after the PP, PPI, it'll see, OK, so how is this transpiring and filtering into the PCE numbers? So we still remain data dependent for the Fed, but there's obviously a clear narrative um, for the ECB. So this will actually put keep um, Euro quite under pressure for some time. Mary, it's all ahead of us. Thank you so much. That's Bloomberg's M Live strategist, Mary Nicola. Joining us now is Sophie Wynn, who is Senior Cross Asset Strategist at BNP Paribas Asset Management. Sophie, thanks so much for joining. So just since yesterday, we've seen the 10-year yield drop a few basis points. And really, we're back to where we were about a month ago now on the 10-year. What is the bond market telling you will happen this year in terms of Fed rate cuts? I think what the markets are telling us at this point is that inflation is still under control. Um, but at the same time, the fact that since the start of the year, uh, you had this divergence between equities and bonds, um, you can basically start playing this barbell portfolio where you can still be long equities and risky assets and be long bonds at the same time, given this disinflation outlook that is still on track uh, this year. Um, so it's basically quite risk on for the next couple of, of months in our view. Well, Sophie, is that the case even for equities? Because as we're mentioning, you know, the uh, U.S. equities at least hit an all-time high on Thursday. Uh, is, is that just going to continue to keep going up? Actually, if you look at um, the valuation of equities, uh, especially U.S. equities, if you exclude uh, tech and the MAX7, uh, on the 12-month trading P. Uh, the S&P is as cheap as European stocks. So I think the level like kind of matter and trigger all this uh, talks about exuberance. But if you try to measure exuberance itself and like even taking Bitcoin into account, we don't have yet signs of big exuberance of complacency in the market. And the fact that we're still into, if you look at the OECD leading gator, the fact that we're still into an expansion mode um, the S&P usually peak in a slowdown, not an expansion. So we think that for the next couple of quarters, at least until the end of the year, there's still room for equities to climb higher. So how are you reading the commodities complex then, Sophie? Because we are seeing sort of different dynamics play out there. Are, are they 
telling you anything about how healthy demand is? I think the commodity complex has been pricing a much more pessimistic scenario. The, the commodities have been focused on spot demand um, and supply, and the demand side of things have been a bit disappointing for the past 12 months. So there's much more pessimism embedded in our view on commodities, and that's why um, we're basically overweight this asset class as a hedge against geopolitical risk that is not really priced, but also as um, like kind of like this catch-up effect we could have in the next couple of months, on top of which China could add much more momentum. Yeah, Sophie, let's turn to China. I mean, uh, of course, we've been talking about the parliamentary uh, proceedings that have been happening this week. Uh, still not seeing any sort of response in terms of market reaction, market excitement, exuberance, as you just said. Uh, but it, it sounds like you, you believe that that's, that's to come. People have been bearish on China for the past 24 months, and they always have a reason to be pessimistic. In our view, uh, what happened this week and all the announcement we've seen so far, were kind of more on the positive bias, as in they're focused on their structural reforms, they're going ahead with it, they have pinpoint which sectors uh, they want to focus on. But at the same time, they're also aware of the short-term risk um, and this left tail risk, and they're tackling with it. So putting a floor on the left tail risk at the same time having this growth target focused on medium term outlook, we think it's like a great combination to start gearing up to Chinese equities, which are quite cheap um, at this point. Would you just buy indexes, Sophie, or how would you go about buying into China? So you can buy Chinese exporters, which makes sense, and that's um, go in line with uh, the uptick in uh, PMIs, but also uh, Euro uh, data starting to turn a bit up recently. Uh, but I think the A15 index uh, could be quite interesting as well, uh, given the weight uh, put on sectors that or kind of where um, the policymakers are focused on. But broadly, just being long Chinese equities, uh, betting on a tactical P expansion, we think it kind of makes sense on top of the diversification benefits at this point in global portfolios. Uh, and, and Sophie, EM, if we talk about EM's ex-China, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, are we going to see other emerging markets really benefit uh, from from this current period right now? Do you think there, there will also be global investors saying that potentially this is an opportunity uh, considering those cheap valuations that you just mentioned? MSCI EM ex-China have already benefited from this, the fact that China has <laughs> been in the slump and this pessimism. I think what EM uh, could benefit on is more the fact that VO remains subdued. We're still oscillating between the soft and low, no landing scenario, and that's quite good for curry harvesting. And at this point, EM are still kind of this um, space where curry is still attractive. So we think um, they could still benefit from, from this backdrop. What about other geographies, Sophie? Any interest in Japan, for example? It's had a huge run-up, but the people are still interested. We're still positive on Japan, and especially on uh, the Japanese yen. Uh, but Japanese equities have been quite a good long for us uh, with a medium-term investment horizon in mind, uh, given the corporate governance uh, reforms, but also the fact that um, at this point, um, you have this disynchronization in terms of monetary policy compared to um, other regions. I think what I could be a bit worried about in the short term is if you have some rotation out of uh, Japan into China, then you could have this outperformance of Chinese equities versus Japanese equities. Uh, so we prefer at this point to belong the Japanese yen. Um, given the uh, looming um, near exit we could have either in March or April, which could boost the currency much more than Japanese equities uh, that have been rallying quite a bit um, at this point. Yeah, that's right. Uh, fascinating insight to get you on. Uh, Sophie Huun, uh, Senior Cross-Asset Strategist at BNP Paribas Asset Management, joining us from London this morning. Sophie, great to have you on. All right.
Plenty more still ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Jennifer Zabasabja in Johannesburg. Here are some of the other stories we are following at this hour. Egypt has gone from the brink of economic disaster to unlocking more than $40 billion of investments and loans from the UAE and IMF, with the likelihood of more to come from Saudi Arabia and others. Bloomberg understands that Egyptian and Saudi authorities are in preliminary talks over the development rights for a northern Red Sea coastal area known as Ras Gamila. If a deal is agreed, it would see the kingdom follow neighboring UAE, which announced a $35 billion investment in late February, the biggest in Egypt's history. Sticking with the region, Saudi Arabia's government has transferred a further $164 billion stake in Aramco to the Public Investment Fund. It's a move aimed at bolstering cash flow at the state-backed investor that's ramping up spending on, a, on huge local projects. The 8% stake transfer will cut the government direct ownership in the world's largest oil company to 82%. The move, though, will have no impact on Aramco's dividend. And finally, Dubai has imposed a 20% annual levy on the taxable income of foreign banks not based in the Emirates International Financial Center. The tax includes a 9% corporate levy that went into effect last year. The Dubai International Financial Center is exempt from the new law. It's the financial free zone of the Emirate that houses the headquarters of some of the world's largest banks. All right. And we have plenty more still to come. Uh, there's a shot of Dubai right there. Uh, but stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. President Joe Biden says the U.S. will establish a temporary port on the Gaza coast to ramp up the delivery of aid and ease the humanitarian crisis. Also in his State of the Union address, President Biden cast himself as the bulwark against the rising tide of threats to democracy, both at home and abroad. Plus, global stocks rise on dovish signs from central banks. Jerome Powell says the Fed is not far from the confidence needed to ease policy. Focus now shifts to U.S. jobs data out later today. It is just past 9.30 a.m. across the Emirates, 7.30 a.m. here in Johannesburg. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja. And I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. And Jen, we are looking at a picture here of the MSCI Asia Pacific Index, which, as you can see, is higher, following global stocks higher. We had an update yesterday after Fed Chair Powell's comments. He said, basically, the Fed is very close to the levels of confidence needed to start cutting rates. And that sort of gave the market a green light to expect rate cuts for the rest of the year. We'll see if that continues tomorrow. We did have the S&P up 1% in the Thursday session and the Nasdaq up 1.6%. But don't forget, we have the jobs data at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time, so just a few hours away. That could change everything or it could change nothing. We have the 10-year yield at 4.0768, so those yields have been coming down all month and we're at basically lower than where we were about a month ago. Markets are pricing in about 90 basis points of cuts this year now. That's sort of a compromise, let's say, between markets and the Fed where they were about a month ago. Right now, the Fed is still saying 75 basis points and the markets are saying, well, we think you'll have to go a little more than that. We are seeing a bit of strength in the crude markets again today. Brent crude is well above $83 a barrel. So let's take a quick look at this chart because it does show very graphically just how much less hawkish the Fed has become, particularly over the last few weeks. So we sort of achieved peak hawkishness there in mid-2022, came down a little bit in 2023. And since the beginning of 2024, according to Bloomberg Economics modeling of Fed sentiment, we have come way down. And we're almost at neutral. Not quite, but almost. Definitely way less hawkish, Jen. 
Yeah, that's right, Vani. Look, I'm taking a close look at what's happening in the FX space uh, because it's interesting, especially if you take a look at the Bloomberg dollar uh, index, uh, starting off slightly weaker uh, on Friday. Uh, but this is now the sixth day of declines for the greenback, as you can see there. It's headed for its third weekly drop and the longest losing streak of the year. Uh, the weakness, though, helping support other currencies, as you can see uh, from the MSCI EM currency index. Uh, most major and emerging market currencies have been higher over the past few days. Uh, the the uh, South African RAND uh, seeing a bit of weakness right now, but uh, really over the past few days has seen um, some upside in terms of uh, EM currencies. The question, though, as you were posing uh, before, Vani, is how will today's U.S. jobs report potentially impact the dollar's trajectory uh, and how will that trickle uh, across the globe? So we'll pay close attention to that. Uh, let's, though, check in on how markets in Asia are faring right now. Avril Hong is in our Singapore studio. Hey, Avril. Hey, Jen. Yeah, as we hear those dovish signals from Powell and the ECB, the BOJ is sounding quite different and investors are increasingly pricing in a BOJ rate liftoff in two weeks. The yen is extending gains from yesterday, now sitting comfortably below the 148 handle. This is the strongest level against the greenback since at least the start of February. Let's flip the board because as you can imagine, the strength in the Japanese currency is putting pressure on stocks and the Nikkei is erasing the gains of about 1% earlier on in the session. Some green on the CSI 300 and the Hang Seng, but still headed for losses on the week as that NPC underway this week has really failed to spark joy. Flip the board again because we're also seeing a rally in Chinese government bonds and we're seeing the yield on the 10-year set for its biggest weekly drop since August of 2022. And this rally is also in a way prompting Chinese regulators to scrutinize the bond buying of regional lenders. They're worried that they are doing this more for speculation than for lending to help to boost the economy. That's what we're seeing in Asia today. Guys. There's so much going on. Avril, thank you. That's Avril Hong in Singapore. Well, in the State of the Union address, President Joe Biden warned that democracy is endangered at home and abroad, a threat he says made more immediate by the prospect of his predecessor, Donald Trump, returning to the White House. My purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Bill Farries for context now. So, Bill, on global issues, the war in Ukraine, for example, and China, what was his key message? Well, as you heard there, President Biden really began his speech talking about what he called the threat to democracy at home and abroad. Abroad, he specifically got into the issue of Russia's war in Ukraine. He was pressing lawmakers to pass this $60 billion aid package that's been stalled since late last year. It's not clear when or if that package will emerge uh, from the continuing budget negotiations. But he said that if uh, Ukraine fails uh, in its fight against Russia, that uh, Vladimir Putin will continue on to other countries. So that was the kind of urgency he was pushing on lawmakers. When it came to China, he was relatively brief, but he said his, the goal of his administration is to have uh, competition and not conflict. It was a change of tone from a year ago when you had that alleged spy balloon uh, having floated over the U.S. And, and relations between the two world's two biggest economies were really in a tailspin. He did praise his efforts to rein in exports of high technology chips and equipment to China, and he said that's something that Donald Trump had the chance to do but never did. In, in terms of the U.S. election bill, I mean, it's hard to not see this speech as, as somewhat of a campaign speech, especially if you look at the way Biden was energetic and was, you know, uh, responding to the crowd. I mean, how much of this do you think was him speaking directly to the voters ahead of November? It was absolutely a 100 percent a campaign speech, an opportunity for President Biden to be alone at the podium, uh, to not have to take questions and to really try to set the frame uh, of the coming debate over the over the next uh, seven and a half months until the election. He talked about a lot of the hot button issues, spent a lot of time on the things that American voters are looking at now, whether you're talking about immigration and calling for uh, legislation to go to his desk that would allow him 
uh, give him more authority to shut down the border at peak periods, uh, and also issues like abortion, uh, abortion rights. And he singled out people he had uh, and guests he had up in the stands who, uh, who had had to leave places like Alabama and Texas uh, because of, uh, of, of abortion issues and restrictions that had been passed in those states. So this was very much a, a chance for him to talk about mostly domestic policy and to try to get voters fired up, get his base fired up, and try to win some of those independent voters who uh, perhaps supported Nikki Haley or perhaps have tried to stay out of the political debate so far this year. Well, and then in terms of pocketbook issues, Bill, what economic proposals did we hear from the president tonight? Well, uh, at the two ends of the uh, income spectrum, you had him talk about a proposal to have uh, to tax billionaires a minimum of 25 percent of their income. That's something uh, the Democrats have been talking about for a while, but have struggled to get through uh, Congress and will continue to struggle to get through Congress. And he talked about having a $400 a month tax credit for Americans to uh, help try to boost home ownership rates. A home, those kind of uh, the purchases of new homes by Americans have plunged uh, in the U.S. As, as many other countries with uh, higher interest rates. That's uh, that's actually something that may be more in the the hands of the Fed at this point than the U.S. Congress, but it's a proposal that President Trump wanted to get out there, uh, or sorry, President Biden wanted to get out there uh, ahead of the full campaigning. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see whether or not voters uh, buy that. Bloomberg's uh, Bill Ferries. Bill, thank you so much for staying on top of this story for us. Uh, let's turn now to the African region. Sub-Saharan Africa is returning to the global bond market. Ivory Coast, Benin and Kenya broke the region's two-year Eurobond issuance hiatus this year. And Bloomberg Economics expects Nigeria, Angola, South Africa and Gabon to follow. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Andira Oganga, who is in Kigali for us with more. Uh, so, Andira, talk to us about what these African countries uh, are looking at or, or what exactly do they have in common that they're all now going back to the bond market? Jen, what they have in common is that many of them had been locked out of the lending market. Um, in 2022, the cost of borrowing skyrocketed, and many of them could not afford. With the prospects of rates going down, we are likely to see many of them easing back to the market. Another reason could be that some of them are seeking funding to finance their bonds that are due. Take Kenya, for example. They had a euro bond, $2 billion due in June, that left investors a little bit jittery and sure if Kenya was going to meet its debt obligation or it was going to default. They went back to the market $1.5 billion to refinance their loan over seven years, but they paid through their teeth a premium of 10.375%, which is way higher than what Ivory Coast and Benin secured that was below 10%. Another reason could be that some of these countries have good fundamentals, but they're seeking to show up their FX liquidity and also seek alternative financing for their budget deficits. Andero, what kind of timelines are we looking at here? We're looking at 2024 and 2025. Take Nigeria, for example. Um, they are likely to go back to the market in the last quarter of this year because they have a euro bond due in 2025, $1.2 billion. But the reason why they'll be going back to the market is because they're currently grappling with FX liquidity challenges. And so um, their reserves have fallen from about $42 billion to $33 billion post-pandemic period. And so Nigeria is a country that finds itself in a very tricky position. However, this issuance will not be as expensive as Kenya's because they're in a position to meet their short-term debt obligations and also interest rates might have gone down by the time they're ready to go to the market. Angola is another country that um, will likely go to the market between 2024 and 2025. They have debt $864 million due in 2025, but they're currently having a weak external position. Their oil revenues have fallen by a third, shrinking their current surplus account um, by almost a third. And so this is a country whose currency has lost 40 percent of its value and is likely to go back to the market. South Africa, on the other hand, strong um, performance and strong outlook, BB rating. They've finished paying their $1.5 billion um, in January, and they're likely to refinance their $2 billion in 2025.
Great reporting there. Bloomberg's Indira Aganga in Kigali for us. Indira, always great to have you on the show. Uh, and let's stick in South Africa, as she was just talking about there. South African financial services company Sanlam is supporting a controversial government plan to overhaul the country's health care system. CEO Paul Henrati told us the private sector could actually benefit from the national health insurance bill. Take a listen. Our constitution uh, mm -hmm. requires us to... Um, to provide universal health care. Certainly, we think that that is uh, something that can be done in this country. Uh, I, I do believe that one of the key issues is what exactly the minimum benefits are. These have not been uh, laid out. So when people say that it's unaffordable, that is based on an assumption, and I would go as far as to say speculation, as to exactly what those minimum benefits are. If they cost at the right level, and build up over time, um, it may well be affordable. The other thing is that the private sector, the private health sector in South Africa is unbelievably good and is able to deliver, I believe, a lot of what the country needs. In fact, I'm told that the private sector can, um, you know, can offer a hospital bed for less than the public sector. So one of the big issues is efficiency. And actually, if we could have the right public-private uh, partnership in this space, it actually could be, you know, very good for the country. So I don't start out as, as negative about the bill. I think there are a lot of undefined pieces about it that will need to be dealt with. I think one of the big dangers is that the determination of the, what the, those benefits are that will be provided in terms of the uh, national health insurance are left in the hands of a single person, uh, as I understand it. And that clearly can be pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the area that needs to be addressed. And the other side of it would be the financing. You know, how, how should it be financed? And, you know, how much need is needed depends on the level of benefits. You can go back in the circle. So um, I think there's lots of work for everybody to do, you know, in this, in this area. That was Asan Lam, CEO Paul Henrati, speaking with us earlier. Okay, plenty more still ahead. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg is learning that Abu Dhabi Wealth Fund, ADQ, has picked advisors including Citigroup, HSBC and first Abu Dhabi Bank for a potential IPO of Etihad Airways. Let's get more with our equities reporter Farah El Bahrawi. So Farah, what do we know about this listing? Good morning, Fani. So we do know that ADQ has also picked Rothschild as an in, uh, independent advisor, financial advisor for this listing. Etihad will be uh, the first major Gulf car carrier to go public uh, on our exchanges over here in the Gulf. And um, uh, this listing uh, was, uh, ADQ is actually uh, thinking of making this a direct listing instead of a potential IPO. Bloomberg has learned that as well. Uh, but now we are expecting an IPO, which would come after a few tumultuous years for it to have on the back of a costly growth plan. Um, but now international travel, travel is back very strongly after the pandemic, with it uh, profits growing fivefold, uh, as we saw in its earnings report this week. Um, so we're saying we're, we're still waiting to see um, details on the timing, on the size. Uh, we don't know the, that just yet. A TAD CEO told CNBC that um, that will be uh, potentially up to ADQ, its um, owner, uh, as of now. And uh, we're very excited, potentially, uh, for, again, more and more sectors coming to uh, the uh, And meanwhile, Farah, uh, Egyptian stocks are continuing to be volatile. I mean, what is, what's happening here? What are analysts telling you? Yeah. Absolutely, Jen. It's... Um, quite volatile, as you put it. The first day uh, after uh, the currency was devalued and the central bank hiked interest rates, the stock market rose as much as 5% before falling 3% uh, by the close. And then the next day, after Egypt secured the IMF uh, deal with $8 billion, the market soared another 5%. So extremely volatile, I would say, expect that to continue over the next few sessions. Uh, but it, local investors have been buying a lot of Egyptian shares. The market is outperforming most other uh, major markets in the world. 
um, over the past year because they see it as a hedge against inflation. Now, the uh, rate hike of 600 basis point, what, what points, what does that mean for inflation and what does that mean for investors? Do they need to keep investing in the stock market? Um, analysts are also saying with banks issuing certificates of deposits with very high yield, there will be competition with investing in the stock market. So that's the space to watch out for if there's any sort of pullback in Egyptian stocks. Farah, thank you so much uh, for that updated reporting there. Our Middle East reporter, uh, Farah al-Bahrawi, joining us from Dubai. Plenty more still ahead. This is Bloomberg. It's jobs day, and Bloomberg has the report under surveillance. We've had unemployment sat to 4% for two consecutive years. This is a two-sided sword. There is a softening in labor demand. Today, Jonathan, Lisa, Anne-Marie, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is a very strong labor market. The White House has got to love this. This is something huge they want to run on. Where is the slowdown? If you look at the reality, it ain't showing that. The February Jobs Report, today on Bloomberg. The CEO of McLaren Racing has denied that Formula One has a culture problem following allegations of misconduct by Red Bull team principal Christian Horner. Zach Brown spoke to my colleague Guy Johnson from the Bloomberg Power Players event in Jeddah. I don't think Formula One has a, a culture problem. I think if you look at uh, the way the sport has become very uh, inclusive, the you know, we have our, our female racing series, the F1 Academy, uh, debuting this weekend uh, at, at McLaren. We've got uh, lots of uh, awesome activities to embrace, uh, you know, underrepresented individuals in, in the sport, in, including uh, women around the STEM. So I think what we're, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the topic here, I believe, is uh, an isolated uh, incident that uh, rests with uh, a team that, you know, is is working through this issue. The sport's working through the issue. I think it needs to be handled in a very uh, transparent manner. There's lots of rumors and speculation until things, I think, be uh, become clear to everyone. Those rumors and speculations will continue. But uh, yep. I do not believe it represents the uh, the wider Formula One. OK, you mentioned F1 Academy it kicks off this weekend. Uh, we're all delighted to see that happening. This is designed, as you say, to promote women in the sport. And, and that's fantastic. But, but do you not think that, unfortunately, the timing is bad here, that ultimately that launch, that, that effort to really push that side of the sport is going to be undermined by what is happening here? I think reality is timing's never good for a, s a situation like this. I think it's uh, it's very unfortunate. It's the start of the Formula One season, as you as you mentioned. We've got the, the great you know F1 Academy that you know all the teams are participating in. It's something we've put a lot of time and effort into and are very excited about. So yeah, it's it's not good timing, but I don't think there would have been good timing yep. uh, for for this particular story. So I I just hope that the uh, the governing body. Uh, deals with it uh, in, in a swift manner because it is going on and has gone on uh, too long to have a conclusion that uh, everyone feels satisfied is is the right conclusion. So hopefully uh, that will happen here in, in short order so we can uh, focus on our racing. That was McLaren Racing CEO Zach Brown speaking with Bloomberg Sky Johnson there. All right, let's get you some other stories we're watching this morning, starting off with Sweden. Sweden has officially become the 32nd member of NATO, completing the alliance's historic enlargement into the Nordic region. The Swedish flag will be raised on Monday over the organization's headquarters in Brussels. Sweden's addition comes 21 months after it bid for membership following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, with the holdup due to objections from both Turkey and Hungary. Bloomberg has also learned that Kristalina Georgieva is poised to secure sufficient support for a second five-year term as IMF Managing Director. She needs the backing of major European nations and the U.S. to ensure the success of any potential bid. Sources say Georgieva's pursuit of a second term would come with the understanding that she has the support of France and Germany. 
And Rivian shares are up after it announced its halting plans to build a new multi-billion dollar factory in Georgia. The move will lead to more than two and a quarter billion dollars in savings, with production of Rivian's forthcoming R2 model shifting to an existing plant in Illinois. The R2 is a cheaper model and will complete and compete with cars sold by Tesla. Palantir Technologies is adding multiple new customers for its suite of AI tools. They include CBS Broadcasting, General Mills and Aramark. Speaking with Bloomberg, Palantir CEO Alex Karp also cited growing interest for the technology that's helped more than triple the company's stock over the past year. We haven't been able to meet demand. We've had to tell people we couldn't accommodate them. We have uh, I, hundreds of people coming, not just people, but leaders of industry. Palantir CEO Alex Karp there. Well, that's it for myself in Dubai and Jen Zabazaja in Johannesburg. Stay with Bloomberg.